Hello, students. This is Professor Gore, and um, now we're into kind of the last module of this course, and we're talking about uh, the 1980s, the 90s, and the 2000s, and so forth. Um, so I want to talk about, uh, first off, is the conservative resurgence, um, and really Reagan's first term in office, and I'll cover the um, second term in a later lecture, and so forth. But really, um, the 1960s was kind of a triumph of, of liberalism. You see this with the Supreme Court decisions and so forth. Uh, you know, Matt versus Ohio, Roe versus Wade that legalized abortion. Um, and also, um, you know, the way college campuses were going and so forth. And, and um, also you had a Democrat controlled Congress to a lot of the 70s. Part of that was because of Nixon and Watergate uh, and so forth. And so um, the late 1970s, Conservative Republicans took advantage of, of really kind of blunders by liberal Democrats, um, as some historians call it, and built a formal political coalition. Now, the kind of this rise of conservatism dates back to 19, uh, early 1960s with Barry Goldwater, the uh, congressman from Arizona. He lost uh, the presidential election against LBJ because he wanted to use nuclear weapons in Vietnam. It seems kind of too radical. Uh, but Reagan um, ends up kind of carrying on the conservative torch from Barry Goldwater later. He'd been a governor of California. He'd been a former actor uh, and so forth. And um, he kind of represented this uh, this rise in, in, of the conservative resurgence. Um, he also had actually been a former Democrat and really his favorite president was uh, FDR. Um, and I thought it was kind of fitting that his favorite president was FDR because they both had something that you just can't teach. And that's charisma and charm. Um, and so he had won the governorship of California in 1968 after Nixon had became president and won it again in 1972. His impassioned rhetoric supporting limited government, low taxation and law and order won broad support among citizens of really the, uh, of the most populous state in the country, California, um, and really made him a force in national politics. Um, he almost beat Gerald Ford for the nomination in 1976 uh, primary. And so you got to understand uh, the appeal of Reagan. He's oftentimes been called the great communicator, um, and he was able really to communicate well via television. Now, granted, he was an actor. This is what he did for a living, uh, but he was great at public speaking, uh, and he, he kind of had the way to kind of, uh, you know, how do you make you feel and so forth. And he could charm most people he came across. And I never was able to charm Tip O'Neill, uh, the famous uh, Democratic Speaker of the House, um, and they oftentimes were political odds and have to come with, up with compromises and so forth behind closed doors, which would be nice in this day and age of political climate. But um, and so Reagan had kind of that that charm that you just can't teach like FDR um, and, and, you you know, uh, made him a great uh, politician and so forth uh, to be able to to be able to kind of win over people uh, to him. It was, it was funny. Uh, he laughed easy and so forth, and that, that kind of put people around him at ease. Now, the new right. Let's talk about uh, who this new right was. Um, and so, really, conservatives began to mobilize opposition against the Democratic Party and its liberal agenda, really when the economy was cruddy in the 1970s. You know, you don't typically see a lot of change happening in good economic times. You see it in bad economic times. Also, a failed war in Vietnam, and they felt like the country had been lied to, which in some parts it had. Um, you also saw African-American riots, a judiciary that legalized abortion and enforced school busing, and an expanded federal regulatory state. Now, Jimmy Carter did reduce regulation, but not as much as they wanted. And by the mid-1970s, conservatism commanded greater public support. And the South, white Democrats uh, began voting Republican as more civil rights legislation was passed. And middle class suburbanites and migrants to the Sun Belt states endorsed the conservative agenda of combating crime, limiting social welfare spending, and increased expenditures on military defense. The New Right movement was a grassroots movement. So, just like you see the Civil Rights Movement, it was a grassroots movement. Every day, average Joe American citizens rising up and so forth. This is what you had. And one of the things they were doing is they were going through um, at grassroots, door to door, getting people to register. Uh, getting more and more people to vote for conservative candidates, getting the word out about these conservative candidates and so forth. And it worked at the, the local, the state and, uh, and and parts of the country at the national level as well. 
Um, skilled conservative political operatives such as Richard uh, Vergery, a Louisiana-born Catholic and anti-abortion activist, apply new computer technology to political campaigning. They use computerized mailing lists to solicit campaign funds, drum up support for conservative causes and candidates, and get out to vote on election day. It was very effective. Also, conservative think tanks funded by wealthy conservatives began to spring up. You have the Heritage Foundation, American Enterprise Institute, and the Cato Institute issued poly policy proposals and persistently attacked both liberal social policy and permissive culture that claimed it spawned. These organizations wanted the traditional conservative themes of unrestricted individualism and a free market economy with the hot button social issues of affirmative action, the welfare state, and the changing gender and sexual values. Many well-respected intellectuals became what was called the neoconservatives and gave the party a new respectable idea. So what did this new right want to cut? All right, well, they want to cut government social programs. They felt like that people who weren't working were getting rewarded by the federal government with these cash grants from like the Great Society for doing nothing. All right. And so there was three prominent organizations that, that helped support Reagan and other conservatives getting elected. The Moral Majority. This was a, a Christian conservative organization founded by Pat, um, I'm sorry, by uh, Jerry Falwell. Um, and then later the Christian Coalition is founded by uh, uh, Pat Robertson. The National Rifle Association, which traditionally had been an organization that, that focused on um, gun safety and so forth, um, became to support conservative um, candidates, uh, particularly who didn't want to restrict uh, access to, to firearms. And then the Heritage Foundation, among others. Okay, the Cato Institute was one I mentioned. And um, here's some things that they these um, these conservatives supported. They supported combating crime. Crime really had gotten out of hand in the 1960s and 70s. You look at some of the crime rates in the 1970s uh, in major cities; it, it was bad. And, and both parties could agree that the crime had gotten out of hand. Um, also, uh, limiting social welfare spending. That's one of the things that. Reagan is, is praised for by the right today and criticized by the left for is the left argues that he kind of make a made a war on poverty while the right felt like that that uh, he was trying to curtail some of the the welfare spending that for people rewarding people for having children outside of wedlock and and uh, who weren't working and so forth also Reagan is going to spend a ton on the military in fact he's going to increase the deficit more than the, the previous presidents before him and uh, really leave H.W. Bush uh, and his one term presidency uh, a big old problem that is going to actually H.W. Uh, Bush is going to make probably the right decision long term for a country, but ends up costing him reelection. And then, um, like I said, this new right uh, movement was a grassroots movement. And so they really got more people involved by going door to door, sending out computer mailers, ra raising campaign funds, because part of the reason. One thing you have to do with campaigning is you have to raise money to be able to put your message out there and put your face out there to travel, to speak to people. All of that costs money and you have to be able to, to campaign rate or raise campaign funds. And so the neoconservatives are these conservative intellectuals who came up with a lot of these conservative policies and ideas. OK, so these are like conservative academia and so forth. So um, now at this time, conservatives. In the, in the late 70s and 80s, didn't have a problem with a school integration. Okay, um, they, they supported Brown Board of Education, but they just didn't agree with the busing. They didn't like their kid being a bus across town just to go to school with you know minority kids or minority kids bus across town to go to school with white kids. Um, they said that they should go to their local elementary school. Now, if you have minorities that move in the neighborhood to go to that school, then they should go to that school and shouldn't be prevented. But you shouldn't uh, take all these efforts for busing. That was their view. Okay. Where others are going to argue uh, on the other side that, uh, well, hey, if we don't bust, then we'll have segregation uh, by uh, de facto segregation. Okay, not de jure segregation by law, but de facto segregation. And so that appealed even to the Midwest and the South as well. But um, a lot of conservatives claim that affirmative action was just reverse discrimination. It's discrimination against white people just by being white uh, and, and just to uh, promote uh, or allow uh, minorities uh, admission just because they were minority, not because they were qualified. Um, and really, blue collar Democrats um, disagreed with affirmative action, which is where Reagan was going to appeal to uh, in both of his elections and what they call the Reagan Democrats, who are really moderate. And so if you can uh, if you can your message can appeal to them, they will vote Republican when otherwise they would not have. And so 
Reagan was able to win over these these uh, Reagan Democrats, as they're called, these blue collar workers that had, were frustrated with affirmative action and so forth. Now, here's some of the, the conservative think tanks. They would do research and statistical uh, research to give evidence for these these candidates running for office or in Congress or the uh, and so forth. And um, uh, you also have um, liberal think tanks as well. Uh, think Progress is one. It's a, it's a famous liberal uh, think tank that, that that does research and so forth to support liberal policies and and so forth. So they both have them. Um, also, what you began seeing is more religious groups getting involved in politics than had done in previous decades. And so you see Catholics and Protestants joining forces in politics in the 70s and 80s to fight against um, uh, growing divorce rates because of no fart divorce laws began coming about in the 1960s. You see gross, uh, divorce rates increase. Uh, abortion, the Roe versus Wade Supreme Court uh, decision of 1973, which legalized uh, abortion, uh, became one of the most controversial Supreme Court decisions of the 20th century. Um, it's still a, a uh, hot button social issue today. Um, just both living in Arkansas and Texas, I can tell you candidates will advertise to their base, whether pro-life or pro-choice um, and so forth. And, and we'll put that on their mail flyer and so forth. Also, premarital um, sex was becoming more uh, rampant and it led to a lot of children being born out outside of wedlock. You still see a lot of single parents today and the com combating what they viewed as the radical uh, feminist side. Now, the feminist movement post-World War II kind of is in two groups. You have the more moderate group that's fighting against um, uh, uh, unequal pay and sexual harassment in the workplace. And then you have the more radical feminist group who are want to be liberated from men or kind of uh, anti or, or they're in favor of the equal rights movement, but kind of anti-traditional wife uh, staying at home and, and being dependent on men and so forth. Okay. They also were frustrated with lenient punishments for criminals. They were mad that some of the Supreme Court cases released criminals who had, who had been known to commit crimes uh, and so forth. Like in, in Matt versus Ohio, Matt had possession of child pornography, uh, Gideon versus Wainwright, Miranda uh, uh, versus Arizona and so forth. Um, also this permissive sexuality and, and the culture and so forth. Um, and they didn't like that um, um, welfare payments were going to unmarried mothers who were just having more children to increase their welfare payments in their minds. Okay. And others argue, well, they don't have those welfare payments, won't benefit the children. So you had a, a political a battleground there. And so uh, Jerry Falwell is here on the right. He's the one that founded the Moral Majority. Once they get a lot of conservatives elected, he ends the Moral Majority in the late 80s, saying that they have accomplished their mission. Uh, but the Christian Coalition gets founded by uh, televangelist Pat Robertson, and that kind of continues on even beyond the Moral Majority ending and so forth. Also, uh, economic conservatives called for tax cuts um, and also government re regulations kind of being cut down, which you'll see that Carter, um, Reagan, H.W. Bush, and Clinton will deregulate certain industries. All right, let's look at the election of 1980. Uh, Jimmy Carter had one of the lowest approval ratings of any American president. And uh, as objectively speaking, um, historians view him as not having a successful presidency. Uh, with the massive inflation, the interest rates being ridiculous. I mean, I mean when you're getting all, car loans at 18% interest, that's crazy. Just a bad uh, economy, not being able to handle the uh, Iranian hostage crisis and so forth. Uh, Carter is, is not going to do very well in the election of 1980. Ray, Reagan's going to garner about 51% of the popular vote, but uh, even though he doesn't win an overwhelming number of the popular vote, uh, he wins over moderate Democrats and does very well at um, winning um, the Electoral College. And so uh, now later in his presidency, particularly when we get to his second term, when we get to the Iran hostage crisis, he is known as the Teflon president uh, because it seemed like nothing uh, bad ever seemed to stick with him. Teflon is the most slick um, surface and it's used on the surface of frying pans and so forth. So you look at the election of 1980, uh, Jimmy Carter does not do very well in the Electoral College. He only won uh, in the South of some state of Georgia one Maryland, West Virginia, and Minnesota, uh, but that's it. Um, and the rest of the country majority went to Reagan. Now we did have there was an independent who took some votes, um, getting about six point seven percent of the votes and so forth. But Reagan is going to win about fifty one percent, give or take. 
So let's look at Reagan's first term, and then we'll get to his second term in a different lecture. So let's look at Reaganomics. Um, Reagan uh, and his chief advisor, James A. Barker III, launched a coordinated three-pronged assault on federal taxes, social welfare spending, and the regulatory bureaucracy. Um, they also wanted to win the Cold War, which we'll cover that a little bit later, and, and they advocated a vast increase in defense spending. Okay, And really, they're trying to catch up to the Japanese and German economies who've been whipping the U.S. in the 1970s. Okay, So first thing is, in order to um, – Reaganomics, first thing you do is you got to cut taxes. Okay, the idea behind that is, is if you cut taxes, it puts more hands, uh, money in the hands of citizens who can spend on the economy. Secondly, if you cut taxes for businesses, they'll have more money to be able to grow their business and hire more workers. Okay, so if you're going to cut taxes, then you're going to have a a budget shortfall. So you've also got to cut government spending. So where he wanted to cut. Reagan um, was social welfare programs and increased military defense expenditures. So now part of the reason why Reagan's going to have uh, ridiculous deficits during his time in office is because he wasn't able to get some of the social welfare program cuts the way he wanted because there were plenty of Democrats who voted no against it. Okay. Uh, and so this increase in deficit spending is going to lead to economic growth. And if you were a defense contractor, um, but you're going to lead to some record deficit spending. Now, since then, it's been far surpassed with our deficit spending in the last, uh, you know, almost 20 years now. Um, and so supply side theory, let's talk about what that is. Uh, Reaganomics sought to boost the economy by increasing the supply of goods. If you increase the supply of goods, you've lowered the price. Hence, try to cut uh, down on inflation. And uh, it emphasized the need to increase investment in productive enterprises they believe the best way to bolster investment was to reduce the taxes paid by business corporations and wealthy Americans. This is kind of trickle down economics. Trickle down economics is praised by the, uh, the right, um, typically economically, and then highly criticized by the left, economically speaking. Now, not always. You have people, plenty of moderates have different views on stuff, but that's typically what you see today because normally when I'm teaching in a classroom, this is when I start having a lot of questions from students about uh, economics and, and how the parties view today. Um, supply siders maintain that the resulting economic expansion would increase government revenues and offset the loss of tax dollars stemming from the original tax cuts. In the early part, an assailant failed to assassinate Reagan. Now, some historians argue that Reagan's uh, the attempt on his life really saved his presidency um, because what happened was he was trying to get into um, a presidential limousine. A guy with a 22 pistol uh, tried to assassinate him, and actually, what what uh, if he would if he'd have lived in, in previous decades, he would have died without modern medicine. Um, the guy tried to kill him with a 22, and it was the guy was a lunatic. Um, he was obsessed with Jodie Foster, and he thought by trying to kill the president, he would impress her. Uh, anyway, um, definitely insane guy. Um, well, one of the bullets ricocheted off of the ground and, and hit him, and it was real close to his heart. And so, uh, when Reagan was in the hospital recovering, he he of course he was you know, charismatic and, and funny. He woke up and was like, oh, I thought, I, I sure hope all my, my doctors are Republicans and so forth. And, and of course, when that got publicized, Americans thought that was funny and heartwarming and so forth. And it kind of appealed more Americans to him. And so uh, Reagan was able to win congressional approval of the Economic Recovery Tax Act, all that calls IRTA, the act uh, reduced income taxes paid by most Americans by 23% over three years. And for the wealthiest Americans, those with millions to invest, the highest marginal tax rate dropped from 70 to 50 percent. The act also slashed estate taxes, the levies on inheritance and instituted around 1900 to prevent the transmission of huge fortunes from one generation to the next. Finally, the new legislation trimmed the taxes paid by business corporations by 150 billion over a period of five years. As a result of the uh, IRTA, by 1986, the annual revenue of the federal government had been uh, cut by $200 billion. Okay. So, uh, Congress did approve some welfare, uh, spending cuts, but not all. Okay. Now, uh, one of the things that also happens is in order to get close to having a balanced budget with the tax cuts, you got to cut federal government spending. And so they cut in social programs, but they increase it in the federal, um, uh, uh, for military expenditures, that's going to be an issue. Um, so they did try to propose cuts on, on programs such as food stamps, unemployment compensation, and welfare assistance, such as the aid to families with dependent children. Congress approved some cutbacks, but preserved most of these welfare programs 
because of their importance. Okay. Plus, those congressmen knew the congressmen and women would know the program went out of office. As administration spending uh, cuts fell short, far short of its goal, the federal budget deficit increased dramatically. Military spending accounted for the bulk of the growing federal deficit. And Reagan and his Secretary of Defense, Casper Weinberger, pushed through Congress a five-year $1.2 trillion military program. Okay, $1.2 trillion um, that accelerated arms buildup began in 1978 by Carter. Reagan brought back the B-1 bomber and the MX, a new missile system. Reagan's most ambitious and controversial weapons plans proposed in 1983 was called Star Wars. Let's look at Star Wars. That's actually really supposed to be a strategic defense initiative, but Star Wars, the movie had come out in the 1970s. And so when people heard about this with lasers, like, oh, this is like Star Wars. All right. Now, I always tell students, I don't know what's kind of more humorous. The fact that uh, Reagan really thought we were going to do this and it was going to be the answer to the Cold War or that the Soviet unions took him so seriously they go broke trying to build it themselves. So what it consisted of is that it was going to consist of a defensive system, okay, not an offensive system, but a defensive system that where it's got satellites that can shoot outer uh, laser beams and reflect off of mirrors. And so let's say you have an intercontinental, intercontinental ballistic missile coming in outer space, about to come back, enter the atmosphere and strike the U.S. These um, lasers can shoot it down and so that it can't, none of those uh, missiles could hit us. Um, well, if, if they had the technology in the 1980s, trust me, it would have been built as much money as they poured into this thing. But they can't. But what's crazy is Reagan wants to negotiate with the Soviet Union for a position of overwhelming strength, and the Soviet Union panics when they see this, and they go broke trying to build it themselves. And it actually speeds up the end of the Cold War. So even though uh, Star Wars uh, strategic defense in, uh, initiative did not accomplish its, its goals of creating this defensive laser system, <laughs> It does accomplish its ultimate goal of helping speed up the end of the Cold War. And this is Reagan on a nightly televised broadcast getting excited talking about SDI. And so um, one-fourth of the U.S. federal budget went to defense. So you haven't seen that since the early Cold War. Uh, but it did lead to an inter, in, a quicker end to the Cold War. So really a lot of presidents get credit for the end of the Cold War, but Reagan gets credit for kind of speeding it up. Uh, but our federal deficit tripled by 1989. Remember that when we get to H.W. Bush, because he's going to inherit that um, and going to have to try to battle that. Okay. Now, um, regulatory cutbacks. Advocates of Reaganomics also asserted that excessive regulation by federal government was not good for economic growth. So Carter had started regulatory cutbacks. Reagan continues it. H.W. Bush continues it. And even Clinton continues it to a certain degree. So these agencies, uh, regulatory agencies, provided many services to business corporations, but they also increased their operating costs. To reduce the reach of federal regulatory agencies, the Reagan administration cut their budgets by an average of 12 percent. Reagan, like Nixon, Nixon, continued to transfer regulatory responsibility to the states. So he's like, look, if, if the states want to regulate this stuff, go ahead. Um, and so Reagan, Reagan Secretary of the Interior James Watt, Watt opened public lands for use by private businesses. Watt was forced to resign after making a racist remark, though. Uh, the head of the EPA was also forced to resign for being implicated in a money scandal. During President Reagan's second term, he significantly increased the EPA's budget, creating new wildlife reserves and added acres to the National Wilderness Preservation System and animals and plants to endangered species list. Now, if you look at Reagan early on in his presidency, you would never think he, he was kind of a favor of environmental uh, president, but he actually uh, did more for the environment stuff in his second term than he did in his first term. Now, um, the Reagan economics is going to stall, um, having uh, attained two of his prime goals, the major tax cut and a dramatic increase in defense spending. Reagan did not carry through on his promises to scale back big government and the welfare state because uh, if you look at social programs, some of them don't get cut by Congress. because you got to have Congress to approve that uh, and our big military spending. He also was not able to overturn Roe versus Wade in the courts. Here's James Watt, the Secretary of the Interior, who was forced to resign. He did open up more public land for private development in Reagan's first term, but then later, Reagan's second term, Reagan was a little more conservative with the environment. All right, we'll get to Reagan's second term in the next lecture.